<laughs> Hold on a second. Someone wishes to uh, get snuggled in here. Hi. The owl ran afoul of the comatose coxswain. That's one of that's my favorite little uh, warm up from that Geico commercial. You know which one it is. Uh, I really think that should be the opening of a book somewhere. Eh, who knows? I may give it a try. Sort of a silly thing, which is very appropriate to today's review of Stephen Baxter's Manifold trilogy. I have not read any Stephen Baxter up till now, um, primarily because he's just not my type of sci-fi writer. I mean, I know who he is. He's, he's written quite a bit. He's uh, carved out his own little niche in the uh, entire science fiction pantheon. I mean, my God, the man's done uh, cooperatives with Clark and Asimov. So you'd think I would have done, I would have read something by, from him by now, but no, because my science fiction tastes run to what we used to call mundane science fiction, but they change that now to uh, near earth or, or near future science fiction because who wants to read something that's mundane? I mean, come on. And that's what I like. I like uh, 20 to 30 years in the future or, or situations where we've finally gone out to the solar system and finally started mining the asteroids like we should have been doing all along and we finally got a base on the moon like we should have had 40 years ago. So that's the kind of stuff I like to read and Baxter doesn't really stay in that area. So then you say, but wait a minute, old guy, you are a fan of Alastair Reynolds and he can get pretty far out there. That is correct. Uh, he can very well get pretty far out there, but his humanity, that the humans that he used, are still recognizable as humans. They're nasty and mean and stab each other in the back, just like good old humanity's done forever. So even when he's hundreds of thousands of year, years into the future, you still know that humans are human no matter how cyber organism they become. Baxter is different. Now, I, I again admit to not having read anything before this, but based on the descriptions of his stuff, it's all um, alternate histories and wildly improbable sciences and not grounded in the kind of reality that I like to read. Not that there's anything wrong with that. There are people who like that. Great, fine, uh, read away, but it's just not my... It's just not my style of science fiction, and because, because I find this type of science fiction a bit off-putting. As it is in this trilogy, which isn't really a trilogy, at least as far as I can tell. It seems to be three first books of a trilogy, the only link between them being the same three or four main characters but they appear in three completely different scenarios and you will be hard pressed to see how these books form a standard trilogy. I swear this is actually an ochatology with the first th uh, books for each written and now we wait for the remaining six books to emerge and complete the bewildering set of tales which starts out in book one with future us trying to warn the near future us about the end of the world. Uh, how do they warn us? By sending information regarding the prophecy and creating the blue children to help us avoid it. What? Book one is called Manifold Time and here we are introduced to the two main characters Reed Malenfant and Emma Stoney. Reed is an insufferably self-absorbed jackass ex-astronaut and his ex-wife Emma, is an, who is an ex because of Reed's aforementioned qualities, but, we, but she still can't tear herself away from him. You know, the girls love the bad boys. Anyway, Reed has built an aerospace company and wants to start mining the asteroids without any government 
without any government involvement, and you know how that's going to go. So, there's uh, a lot of political shenanigans and outright criminal activity, and Reed launches his rocket anyway with an intelligent squid as the pilot. Yes, an intelligent squid named Sheena Five, who is about the only character in this whole book who I actually like. Now, if that wasn't plot enough, Reed gets a message from the future redirecting his rocket to an odd near-Earth object asteroid which contains a portal to... well, we're not sure where it goes to, except Sheena Five goes through it, and through it, and through it to just about every single future universe that H.G. Wells wrote about in the time machine, and then some. There was a point where I thought the rest of the book was going to be one description after another of a far future physics-laden universe, but mercifully it ended and uh, we get on with the story which includes these Asperger's Syndrome blue children who can build quark matter generators and lunar bases out of Legos and are really nothing more than a bunch of snot-nosed kids in need of a spanking or a nuclear attack, whichever you think will get their attention. Now add to that interstellar war and time travel and this just gets a bit out of hand. But Hold my beer, because all of this ostensibly leads to book two, which is Manifold Time. At least you'd think it would. I mean, second book of a trilogy and everything, but no, not at all. We are into a completely different story with nary a mention of blue children or smart squids. Oh, Reed's still there, and uh, so is Emma. Uh, but Reed is now a washed up, washed out astronaut making ends meet by doing lectures on Fermi's paradox. And Emma, well, she died. Um, now comes Namato, a Japanese astronomer living on the moon who has discovered alien satellites in the Kuiper belt and needs Reed's persuasive talents to persuade the world that aliens mining the Kuiper belt is uh, something of a big deal. <sighs> This is the first of many problems that I had with book two. Uh, the idea that proof of extraterrestrial life would be met with a worldwide yawn. Yeah, I know we're all supposed to be jaded and ennui and unaffected, but come on. Especially when these aliens turn out to be a collective hive mind of metal-based life forms, Borg. Uh, that reproduce by trading parts, which I guess is how we reproduce too, and it, they um, meld together to make decisions, and turns out they aren't that much smarter than we are. Uh, in fact, they're here to exploit resources for their own benefit, but they become interested in us because we are the first alien race they've ever met that, ha that has faith in uh, things outside of ourselves. And there's a bunch of other alien races all out there showing up at the same time, Fermi's Paradox be damned, including one called the Crackers, who like to Nova stars for fun and profit. Uh, and they've got their eye on our star, and Nimoto, Nimoto is the only one who opposes them, and Malafon's faith is apparently some kind of secret ingredient to netting a neutron star. And what any of this has to do with blue children, I have no idea. Then we get to book three, Manifold Origin. So just forget everything I just said. Malafont has now has been washed out of astronaut training because he doesn't play well with others and in a snit decides to fly to some conference in Africa in a borrowed T-38 with Emma in the back seat. No, she's no longer dead. They hear about a UFO over the Olduvai Gorge, Olduvai, Old whatever, the, you know, where Leaky found the bones. And they head over there and they crash into a blue portal exactly like the one that in book one that Sheena Five went through. And Emma is ejected through the portal onto the red moon, 
which has suddenly replaced our moon. Reed wants to go to the red moon to rescue her, but the world is preoccupied by the earthquakes and floods and other assorted disasters that occur when our benign gray moon is replaced by a red one three times its size. Still no blue children, but lots and lots of quite repulsive pre-humans living in disharmony on the red moon as Emma stumbles her way through what may be Jurassic, Pleistocene, Devonian, Cambrian jungles, who knows. Reed decides to launch a rocket to uh, go find her with Namato as his co-pilot. Wait until you meet the godlike gorillas. What is going on here? I don't know. I just don't know. Uh, I guess I am not sophisticated enough to see the relationship between the various time and place manifolds in which Reed and Emma live what is a million different stories depending upon which universe you happen to stumble. If that's Baxter's point, okay, fine. But it's not my cup of tea. I mean, I like my stories linear. You know, with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, not three completely different beginnings with nothing else following. I suspect that Baxter wanted to write three completely different stories, but he liked Reed and Emma so much he just wasn't willing to let them go. So he tried to pull a fast one by calling this a uh, trilogy about a manifold. Nice try. No cigar. Old guy here. See you later.